this time, this is the late 60s, early 70s, so Atlantic is focused more on, again, Eric Clapton and the Bee Gees. Um, they're focused on big name X. Criteria Studios is considering um, big accounts. The Eagles pass through there, make it their home for a while. After they leave uh, Glenn Johns and their country rock leanings, they become a Miami outfit. The Bee Gees were struggling. Most people think of the Bee Gees as a disco act. They were not a disco act. They were, a, they were what the critics were calling a, a Beatles, not ripoff, but a second coming, which was over, overstated. And when the, when the Bee Gees were struggling, they eventually went, according to the staff at Criteria, to a, a, a private club in, the, in, in 1974 called Honey for the Bears. And Honey for the Bears had a DJ by the name of Bo Crane. Now, Bo Crane is a key figure in Miami bass. Uh, he was just, I say just a disco DJ, but that's, that comes with a lot of power. That comes with a lot of influence. So if um, these private clubs, synonymous with Studio 54 in the 70s, cocaine era, um, if, if Barry Gibb is going to party, at Honey for the Bears or any other given clubs in Miami. And he comes home listening to whatever music those DJs played. Uh, what he brings home is influence. And shortly after, he drives to the studio, drives to Criteria on the uh, Julia Tuttle Causeway. Julia Tuttle, of course, being the person who owned the land and sold it to Henry Flagler. Um, as he hears the thump, thump, thump of driving, Thinking back, I'm sure he must have been in the same mind state of being at Honey for the Bears. This is what ultimately leads to the single Jive Talking. 1974, one of the biggest disco singles of the era. That turns into a massive industry, and there were only three independent labels in charge. What do the major labels feel like? when three independent labels are, are taking charge of the music industry. And Henry Stone was one of them. Now, Atlantic was an independent, but it was ran as an independent. They've been independent for decades. So Atlantic was in charge of the Bee Gees in the US. And Henry Stone is looking over here and saying, this is interesting. One of his warehouse workers was a guy by the name of H. Wayne Casey. And uh, Steve Lamo's mechanic went by the name of Rick Finch. And when the two of these guys met up at TK as bottom dwellers, and they were given a green light to uh, experiment in the studio after hours, they developed a song built on an organ left, I shouldn't say left behind, but used by Timmy Thomas. Timmy Thomas had a song called uh, Why Can't We Live Together? Why Can't We Live Together in 1972 became a hit single for the R&B market, soul market, whatever you want to say. Um, this was disco. Miami became a disco town. Uh, the song, of course, was by George McRae. Uh, Rock Your Baby. Massive, worldwide hit. And I don't think I could say that enough. When we talk about worldwide, these people weren't having worldwide hits. Uh, literally, Steve Alamo told me he was on the plane, flying to the UK. And while he was on the plane, the sh song shot to number one, globally. And when he landed, it was already number one in the UK. Before he could get from Miami to the UK, it shot to number one. And that's when they realized, we've hit pay dirt. They told, uh, I told Steve Alamo and, and, and Casey, you guys can do whatever you want. So they hired the Ocean Liners, a great funk band who played, of all people, Clarence Reed's Wedding. Um, they congealed into Casey and the Sunshine Band. And Casey and the Sunshine Band, I, I, I think it goes without saying, is one of the pinnacles of the disco era. One of the pinnacles of private clubs, one of the pinnacles of um, ex excess. Um, <laughs> Many, many different generations have different opinions on disco. I, I know people older than I am say disco is uh, 
a bastardization, bas bastardization of funk music. And, and that's a fair criticism. I know people my age say, disco is nostalgic. I know people younger than I am say, I don't know what the hell disco was, but I heard it had importance. Well, this is the importance. And when you have a, a business that skyrockets overnight, you don't know what to do, you've got money. And um, when you have money, you want to make money, you got to spend money to make money. And how do you balance that? How do you know how, do you know how much money to spend for how much money to make? That's speculative. You don't know. And uh, ultimately, they were possibly spending too much money. And back at Criteria, always two things, Henry Stone and Criteria. Criteria had accounts. These are people who paid for time. So if the Eagles were paying for time, and, and RSO was paying for time, who fostered the Bee Gees. And then you had other things coming through Atlantic Records who were paying for time. They called it Atlantic South, much like Def Jam did later. They called it Def Jam South. It seems like the money will never end. <laughs> the irony of all this is Clarence Reed certainly was good at writing songs, but he wanted to be something else in his spare time, and that was Blowfly. <laughs> and nobody could have been pre prepared for what Blowfly was. Blowfly seems antiquated today. Blowfly was, I mean, to say a pioneer is just reductive. He's not a pioneer. Blowfly was an individual. <laughs> Blowfly was an iconoclast by nature, not by design. Blowfly was X-rated, was comedic, was entertaining. Blowfly was in a wrestling mask. <laughs> Blowfly is charming. I mean, Blowfly is just fantastic. But Clarence Reed made hits, and that's what matters to the record labels. But Blowfly lives on. Clarence Reed doesn't. And that says a lot. So God bless Clarence for, for doing what was true, not fantastic. And by fantastic, I mean fantasy. He didn't live in a fantasy. He lived in his own mind. The weird world of Blowfly. God bless him.